Welcome to Catching the Light, your daily Bible study. Join us as we discuss God's unchanging truth and show how it can be applied in our day-to-day lives. And now, here's your host, Kip Bradford on Catching the Light. Hello, my friends. It is another episode of Catching the Light. See, I changed it just a little bit. You did. I, I've got to tell you, as many times as I've done this, this is the hardest part, is to have something original to say at the beginning. So welcome to this episode of Catching the Light, in case I threw you off a little bit. Today we have Rebecca. We haven't had you in a few episodes. We've had Kee'i. Yeah. yeah. I hope you enjoyed her and we're we, nice to her. We love having Kee'i. I don't know if we were nice, but we love having <laughs> Kee'i. Uh, we love having Rebecca. So welcome back. Thank you. Um, I, where did you go? Hawaii? Ponape? Where'd you go? <laughs> Church office. Yeah, that's what I thought. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just up the hill. <laughs> Things have been fun. How about for you, Charlie? I am here at Better Life and enjoying every minute. You are enjoying every minute. Until this coming weekend. No, next weekend. Yes. And not that you won't enjoy being at Better Life, but you and I are going on a motorcycle trip. We are. Yeah. We are. So pray for us, please. And stay off the road. (laughs) Um, No, it's good to stay on the road, just rubber side down. Rubber side down. But we won't really be on, well, we'll be on a dirt road. Yes. We are doing dual sport stuff. I don't have my motorcycle license, so I can't ride on the blacktop oh, right yet. Oh, you didn't get that. I haven't had time. To well, the, it, I'm going to give you a little bit more space. I haven't had any time. <laughs> well, I, I'm familiar with motorcycles. Rode them avidly as a kid all the way up. My dad, do you know the Honda XR75? Not personally, but I've heard of it. Yeah, that's a great motorcycle. That's what I wanted. That's not what I got. So... <laughs> I got this Kawasaki 90 Enduro that weighed like a million pounds. <laughs> That's what I got. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Anyway, <laughs> now I got the exact same motorcycle you have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, except that yours was cheaper and nicer and all that. You mean you know. except his is his and yours is yours. Therefore, it's not exactly the same. Yeah, I'm hoping when he's not looking, I'll be able to do a swap. <laughs> but Forewarned is forearm, Charlie. Uh, you know what? <laughs> we'll be ready. <laughs> uh, and you just had a friend of town? Yes, yes. A friend of mine from back east came to visit, and um, I think she and I had more fun than her dog did with your dogs. But <laughs> Well, our dogs our dogs received damage as well. So yes, we, yes. The, the love was spread. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's good to be uh, here to study God's Word. Before we begin, we have something that's really important to do is the Word of the Day. Oh, do we pray before the Word of the Day? Yes, we do. Oh, it has do. been a while since we've done this. Uh, we need to we need pray to... for the word of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, would you open with prayer? Certainly. Father in heaven, we are just praising your name that we get to come together and study your word. We ask that you be here with us and translate for us where necessary. Uh, bless everybody who is ready and willing to dive into the word. Amen. Amen. So do we have a word of the day? We do. And today's word is... Thalassic. 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 T H A L A S S I C. Thalassic. Do you want to go first, Charlie? You know, I, I forgot the stress that I feel every time when I'm waiting to hear what it is and wondering how creative. And see, now I just talk so I can think about it a little bit. Mm-hmm. You can so, talk and think at the same thalassic. time. Thalassic. Thalassic. It makes me think of thoracic. So okay. I'm thinking physical body. I thoracic is up here. I'm thinking, um, I don't know what I'm thinking, thalassic. Can you use that in a sentence? After ah, everybody gets works. their guesses I was, hoping, in. I was hoping we were resting. You always try that, and it so never works. thalassic is a muscle within the thoracic, and that's what allows for elasticity throughout that system. That actually sounds like a really good um, intellectual guess at the meaning. It's wrong, but it sounds good. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> That's Your turn, Kip. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I was thinking thalassic. There's the asic. There's the you know. Uh, the, it sounds stretchy, and you know we have we have. Uh, what do they call that stuff around your underwear? Um, elastic. 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 <laughs> right. And, and so it's a neck band. Thalassic <laughs> is when the is when the the elasticity of the elastic stops being and the thud happens. <laughs> I thought for sure one of you was going to say something about Jurassic Park, but no, it doesn't have to do with any of that. 
So we hate it when a, thud a happens. Thud? Yeah, you know, you, it's you dress the differently elastic. than I do. I don't hear any thud. <laughs> when your elastic wears out? No, there's no thud. <laughs> well, if you have a large enough wallet. <laughs> So, would either of you like to know what thalassic really means? Yeah, really. Save us from ourselves, please. <laughs> it is relating to or being situated around an inland sea. That's what I said. <laughs> thalassic. You have a belly full of water. Okay, I let me, that's true. I need to arrange that in my brain. A related to or situated, or situated around. By, situated around an inland sea. In, so, the Sea of Galilee. Sea. Is, was an inland sea. And so it's thoracic. Thalassic. Thalassic. So <laughs> some of some of Jesus' uh, most well-known miracles uh-huh. were thalassic. They were done near the inland sea of the Sea of Galilee. Oh, Charlie and I were talking about that earlier today, that, that Jesus crossed the sea and stepped off the boat and was met by the man with the demons. Yes. Mm-hmm. He had and the, gone the, the swine had a thalassic encounter. The, they did. They, they had, <laughs> <laughs> Not nearly so pleasurable. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Oscar Mayer. Anyway, um, how much fun is that? I forgot the word of the day it was so silly. <laughs> okay, so we are we are ready to start our Bible study. I think we need to move to more meaningful things. Uh, we are going. We. we we had just finished talking about Wiki'i, so I'll bring you up to speed, mm-hmm. Rebecca, because all of our viewers are up to speed. Yes. They are the sharpest viewers there are. Yes. But uh, we have Rebecca, who is not a viewer. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Kip. Just spit it out that Rebecca's not sharp. Backpedal, backpedal, backpedal. <laughs> anyway, bring me up to speed on, on this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can help. We're picking up in the middle of chapter 14 of Matthew. So, Charlie, what happened in the first part of the chapter? Oh, man. <laughs> okay. Do we need to stop? No, we're good. We're good. This is okay. fun. Okay. This is a tough story. You know, you have Herod putting himself into a situation um, where he leaves himself no way out, and he is used to to kill a prophet of God. Ah, uh, so this is the death of John the Baptist this that is just the happened. Death, death of John the Baptist, and we, it finishes by he he gives this promise out, mm-hmm. and it results in John dying. Now, Be careful what you promise. That's a very serious story. Uh, however, if we just take the 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 framework of the dynamic of that story and we bring it into our own lives, how often have we put ourselves in a position where we have very, a very uncomfortable out. Mm -hmm. And, and at that time we are, we are actually, we have placed ourselves in a, in a situation where we can choose the right way out, which is uncomfortable, or we can do what Herod did and bend. Yeah. And, uh, uh, behave or hide or or do something that is shameful to us and shameful to God uh, for self preservation. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And so we see that many times throughout the Bible, and and you know somebody ends up in a den of lions because you say something mm-hmm. and have to follow through. Mm-hmm. Yes, and yeah, and so King Darius, that, that that's a great example. Yeah. But on the other side of that example is Daniel's example, where he said, you know what. I'm not going to yeah. put myself in a position where I am going to shame God and shame That's myself. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and God always blesses us when we stand for him. Yeah, he's promised him that honors me, I will honor. And I'm sorry, I don't remember the reference for that, but I think it's somewhere in Samuel. But yeah, God has promised and he always keeps his promises. Yeah, so praise God. So we are starting in uh, Matthew 14, Uh, Chapter 14, verse 13, I believe, is where we... Yes. So when Jesus heard it, it being the news of the death of his cousin, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. You know, it's, I've always thought about that. You, 
you focus on going away and getting the food, but the the picture here, the framework here is one of grief, mm-hmm. right? They're grieving the loss. Several of the, Jesus's disciples had been disciples of John as well. Mm. And so reading between the lines, to me, it's also, let us be alone. And just reflecting on that a little bit, we've all been in that position, right? Where we just want to be alone in our grief. But there are times, and I think Jesus perhaps experienced this as well. And uh, this is this is not a time to grieve and be within ourselves. This is a time to reach out and be with others and serve others. And through that service, we can deal with our grief. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah, I, I think that we we begin to heal as we engage in in service to others in the in the context in the realization that that God is with us and has given us purpose so as we start to engage in our purpose with God mm-hmm. uh, I think he can better heal us as we we begin to see that there is a, a larger picture mm-hmm. you know our grief our sadness is real mm-hmm but we talked the other day again about about the short end of the rope. Yeah. You know, the, we have this little piece of rope, which is, uh, well, I have a really long rope and a little piece of leather on the end. And if that leather represents life on this earth before the Lord comes or before I take a dirt nap, right? Uh, but the rest is eternity. Mm-hmm. And we as human beings focus on this little piece of rope or leather strip. But Christ's message was, I want you to focus on eternity. Mm-hmm. And I want as many people who who exist on the short end of the leather to be with me for eternity. Mm-hmm. That's our focus. Yeah. Yeah. And as we engage in that, we recognize that our grief and our sorrow at the end of this wonderful book, God's book, there will be no more weeping or sorrow. Amen. I'm so glad. Verse 16. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish and looked up to heaven. He blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate, they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now, those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. This is incredible. And there are two things that that particularly stand out to me. And I don't think we're going to have time to get to both before the break. But I'll mention the first one real quick. Scholars estimate that there might easily have been 20,000 people total in that group. Matthew only says about 5,000 men. But how many women and children were in there? So the scholars estimate easily 20,000. And yet in Jesus' hands, five loaves of bread and two little fish were more than sufficient mm. to feed all of them. Yeah. I, I love God math. <laughs> you know, it just never makes any sense. And then, and then at the end of that, there's 12, 12 baskets left over. We'll be back right after this message. Thank you for listening to Catching the Light. We pray you're being blessed and encourage you to contact us with your questions and comments. You can reach us by email at radio at betterlifetv.tv. That's radio at betterlifetv.tv. Or visit us at betterlifetv.tv slash catching the light. That's betterlifetv.tv slash catching the light. Or simply call us at 541-474-3089. It's our sincere desire that you'll be blessed while studying the Word of God with us here on Catching the Light. Catching the Light is listener supported. To become a financial partner, visit our website or write to us at P.O. Box 766, Grants Pass, Oregon, 97528. That's P.O. Box 766, Grants Pass, Oregon, 97528. Hi, and welcome back to Catching the Light. We are in Matthew chapter 14. Charlie was just talking about the, the, or actually it was Rebecca. I, I just get you guys confused. Apparently Rebecca was just <laughs> talking about the, the, the multitude, a great multitude, really mm-hmm. 20,000 men and women that, that, that 
for whatever reason, in the culture, they counted the men. They didn't count the women. Now, when I was a certain age, that's all I counted. So <laughs> I don't understand. So, <laughs> well, but, Matthew was a tax collector. He was used to counting heads of households. Perhaps that had something to do with it. I don't know. Well, I think it was more of a cultural thing. I'm trying to help him here, okay? Well, you're trying to help Matthew? <laughs> He doesn't know it right now, but he'll know it someday and he'll thank you for it. Um, so so we have estimated 20,000 people. And at the end of the meal, there was 12 loaves left or 12 loaves, 12 baskets, baskets left over. Uh, I think there's some significant meaning we can't get into there, but we have the 12 tribes of Israel. We have the 12 baskets. There's 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 this recurring theme of 12 that, that relates to the Israelites mm -hmm. in a very special way. It would be interesting to do a study on that sometime. Charlie, you got a thought, I think. Yeah, I was just, I remember growing up, sometimes we scoffed at some of these. I, I, I would scoffed. Oh, I we, thought you, you said scoffed. Scoffed. We'd, you know, you look at somebody speaking and they didn't have a microphone or anything. And how on earth is that even possible? So you, it made me doubt the story. And it was interesting. The other day, we were coming back from backpacking, and Tanya was reading about Whitefield and how he would speak to these multitudes of, of people. And Benjamin Franklin was at one of his, and actually mathematically and distance and everything, figured out how many people could he speak to. And these numbers are right in that range. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just love how things, if, if we'll just study into something and think through it, um, Benjamin Franklin wasn't a believer, um, but he lends credit, credence to stories like this, that yes, this is possible. Mm -hmm. Well, That's all incredible. things are possible with God. So, mm -hmm. so the problem is, is that we leaned on, on human understanding to bring us sure. to godly wisdom. Sure. So, <laughs> but you know, uh, uh, one of my favorite authors, uh, Ellen White was known to be able to speak to great large crowds. And I believe God supplies a megaphone mm -hmm. uh, so that so that a message can be heard. Yes. And, you know, she was just a little bitty kind of sickly lady uh, at times, or at least early on. I don't know, but she didn't have a big voice, I'm sure. Uh, God always supplies the needs when people have a need to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Well, shall we move on to the rest of four chapter 14? So beginning in verse 22... Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. You know, a, a detail that I often have missed in reading through this story is what Jesus did after he sent everyone away. You know, so the, the people were fed. Jesus had the disciples gather up the fragments. And then he sent the disciples out on the boat into the Sea of Galilee. And he sent the people home. And as we're about to see, the next thing we, the next part of the story that we see is, is focused on the sea and the disciples. But what is Jesus doing in the meantime is He's taking time alone with God to pray. And that's such an easy detail to overlook, but that's what gave him power yes. was his connection with his father and taking time to pray. It, it, and talk to pretty much any pastor I know, and we find that is the most difficult thing for us to do is to stop and have the personal time. I mean, people think, well, pastors are in the Word all day. They pray all day. They, they're in the Word all day. Well, we, we kind of are in, in one sense, but it's not that personal time. And we run the risk sometimes of, of avoiding the personal time because we're doing it all the time. But, but we need to find time and make time to, to spend time with God, just like Christ did. He was our mm -hmm. example. He would oftentimes remove himself from whatever was around him. He was known to get up early in the morning and spend time with his father, uh, getting instruction, courage, uh, all of the things that we need to have in order to be effective witnesses. Mm -hmm. we, and, mm -hmm. 
and, and so he leaned heavily. Uh, his will was always with the Father. He said so. He said, I've only ever done what the Father has told me to do. We need to have that same attitude and realize that that is the source for our success. Our success right. is, we are not the source for our success. Right. My own determination is not the source of my success. Praise the Lord. Because if it were just relying on me, it would not be successful. Right. Well, we were just studying saying. the quarterly earlier. Mm-hmm. Um and that was a reference I made that it's like a battery. And as soon as we disconnect from the Bible, as soon as we disconnect from prayer, it's it's discharging. And so mm-hmm. we need to we need to be topping off that battery because that's where the power comes from. Yeah. And t- we determined that the battery had no no yeah. limit. Yeah, it's a battery that the top is off, and it'll continue to grow and become this. Right. more powerful within this power, within the Bible, than it could ever right. be on our own. Yeah. So when it's full, it doesn't top out at a, at a double A. Right. 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 All right. Matthew 14, verse 25. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I do not be afraid. I love that. I love that in life. You know, we can be in these dark, stormy, we can be in the valley and Jesus shows up and that it's, that's the time to rejoice because Mm -hmm. Jesus is there, whatever, whatever else is going on. And boy, he was in prayer a long time. According to the Roman clock, that's from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Oh, the fourth watch? Yeah, the yeah. fourth watch. Um, so this was, they were boy, they were pulling an all-nighter out there. Um, and again, that's just a reminder that Jesus is always on the job. And he is always there waiting for us to call out his name. And not only that, this is right before dawn. And the darkest time of the night is always just before Mm -hmm. dawn. And that's when Jesus loves to show up in our lives is the darkest times. Ah, That's that's a a good observation and analogy. It just hit me. (laughs) Good job. Uh, Back to the the idea of the prayer time, uh, because you brought it up again, is, uh, and I forget the name, I got to find out who this person, preacher was. He was a well-known preacher. I don't know if it was Spurgeon or Whitecliffe or one of those who was known to be a prayer warrior. Mm-hmm. And he was known that the busier his day was, the more he would pray. So that was either Martin Luther or John Wesley. Wesley. I think it was Wesley. Because yeah. both of them would get up, depending on how much they had to do that day, they would get up earlier and earlier Mm -hmm. to spend more time in prayer. The more they had on their schedule, the more time they would spend. Both of them would. But I think Wesley was the one who... Wesley sounds right. ...who commented on it. Because I said Whitecliffe and what W, that's as far as I got. (laughs) So, uh, but the story is that one day he had a very crazy pressing day. And his comment was, it must be a four-hour prayer day which was longer than his normal time. Yeah. He relied on God to, to be his strength to get things done. Mm-hmm. So uh, as much as we like to say, oh man, I have so much to do today. I can only spend so much time, uh, you know, and, and this is advice for all of us, including myself, because I struggle with this, is to, to say regardless of how much time I don't have to accomplish to my stuff today, I'm going to make a commitment to spend it with Christ first, without feeling the pressure of I got to be done and rely on God to help me finish the things I need to do. God math again. God math. That's right. Even yeah. with hours in the day. Yeah. In fact, um, when was that? Uh, was, was it something that we have that happened at Cowboy Church, I think, at Boots and Bibles, is that we didn't have, I think it was then, we didn't have enough soup or something. And they just kept going. And Denise thought, well, I don't think we're going to have enough. It might have been ice cream. Uh, <laughs> I hope it was ice cream because that means it was over. But <laughs> God said, okay, I'll, I'll fix your ice cream. But it seems to me that I remember the story that the gals came back and they said, you know, we didn't run out of anything. It was just, you know. Yeah. God man. Verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. 
And when Peter had gone had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You know, this is the, the, probably one of the handful of most popular stories for children. Uh, however, it should be a popular story for us in, in that it is such a simple story, simple illustration in terms of the storms of our life will distract us. But if we keep our eyes on Jesus, he's always right there to, to rescue us and, and to be with us in the storm. The storm in this story didn't go away. It's just Jesus. And, and, and I love it that Jesus reached out and touched Peter. Didn't just say, um, look at me, dude. Yeah, all you <laughs> there you do go. Is this. Come on. Now you're back out. But Jesus reached out and, and it was relational. He touched Peter. Um, we need to guard ourselves and we can only do that in the word and in prayer and in witness as we are in those three areas, uh, grow and shine for God and him in us. Uh, we need to make that commitment to, to when the storms hit, stop thinking about the storm, start thinking about our Lord. Because it was when, when Peter focused on the storm is when he failed failed when he lost sight of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite words in this segment that you just read, Charlie, is in verse 31, immediately. Immediately Jesus reached out. Barely had those words left Peter's mouth. There was not any, oh, you need to look to me for, it was immediate. He was right there. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And I think it's important to remember, you know, you could easily take that and say, well, God, you didn't show up for me because I called your name and I'm still here suffering. Mm -hmm. Look for where he is reaching out to you. Mm -hmm. It may not be the way you expected, but he is absolutely right there. Mm. Yes. Yeah. We, we so often want to dictate how God will respond. Mm -hmm. I know someone who had prayed that God would, would supply a need and that need actually was supplied. And the person said, uh, they were a bit annoyed because it wasn't in the context of of what they wanted. The supply was met, but it came from over here. Uh, and it was a little more uncomfortable way to receive that supply. So God said, yeah, but you need that discomfort at times because mm -hmm. it leads to humility, understanding. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so sometimes God does respond in a way that, that teaches us a lesson. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. It's good to be grown. And it's, it's so vitally important that we don't lose sight of Jesus because so long as we keep him in focus, keep him in view, then we can see what he's doing and we can, we can have that, um, that walk with him that we want and not lose sight of him. Mm -hmm. That's when we fall. That's when, that's when the storms are huge, whatever the storm is in life at the time, that's when it's the worst. That is true. So uh, we just have a few moments left. So I would just say to our viewers that no matter what the storm is in your life, uh, turn to Jesus. Keep your focus there. He will always be there. We'll see you next time here on Catching the Light. <laughs>